Hello everybody and welcome, my name is Ursa Ryan and we are returning to one of the most requested video formats that I get on the channel. This is an update to my All Seven Leader tier list, now that all the leader pass has been finished. Last time we looked at this tier list, it was after the Frontier Pass, but before the Leaders Pass, and we've had 19 new leaders to add to our assorted list now. In addition, last time I did this list, I had about 3,000 hours in Civ 6. Now, I have about 4,000. 1,500 hours in Civ, which is a frightening amount, and I refuse to calculate what that actually means in terms of real life, because that would be frightening, and I would have a mental crisis if I ever tried to... Let's not think about that. More importantly, though, I've also now almost completed my A to Z challenge, so between the last tier list and this one, I've actually played pretty much every single Civ, so we can have another look at what we've done, and just check we still like it. So without further ado, let's look at the list. There it is, the tier list and as we last left it, and oh my lord, I need to do a little bit of explanation here. Now as mentioned, I have about 50% more hours in Civ 6 now, just about 4,500, so I'd like to think I'm fairly qualified to give my opinion, but do remember, this is of course my opinion. Civ is entirely subjective, and if you do want to leave a comment explaining why maybe you've come to a different interpretation, keep it happy, keep it cheerful, keep it constructive. This channel is fantastic for having such a positive and engaging community. Let's hold that. Those are the values to which I aspire. I like good, friendly conversation. And remember, everyone's opinion is different and people just play this game differently. Speaking of, let me just remind you of the rules of which I make these tier lists because there is always a little bit of context here. Firstly, I am assuming that we are playing single player deity difficulty Civ 6. No multiplayer, no prince difficulty, single player deity. The game plays differently when you play on the hardest difficulty and the game plays very differently with multiplayer. Secondly, I am assuming you are playing a small to standard map with six to eight players, so right bang in the middle of what the game recommends. Again, the game plays so differently if you play a really small map, like a dual map, or maybe even one of the mirror maps, or what was it called, the six leaf clover map, that sort of thing. And it plays even different still if you're playing a 12 player huge islands map, or maybe even like a 20 player TSL map. We're assuming we're right bang in the middle, small to standard, six to eight players. I am assuming that we are playing with no mods that change the gameplay at all. The Steam Workshop, Epic Store, all of these places have all kinds of mods that can change, balance, or tweak the way that Civ runs. Be it additional satellites, game fixes, balance changes, better balance starts, all that sort of thing. We are assuming we're not playing any of those. We are playing with all of the DLC, but we are playing with no gameplay changing mods. Equally, I am assuming that we have no game mode turned on at all. I know, game Game modes can change the game drastically. Let's put Barbarian Clans on, for instance, or Secret Societies, or Heroes and Legends. We all know, for instance, that Trajan's Room with Void Singers is amazing because you get the old god obelisk instead of your monuments. Yeah, I know that. It's wonderful. But no, we are playing base Civ 6 today. No game modes. Civ as it comes. I'm going to be playing a continents map when I assume this, so a mixture between naval combat and exploration and landlocked combat and holding your own on your own continent. So you're probably going to be on your continent with, if for instance we're playing a six player map, maybe two to three sieves. If we're playing an eight player map, somewhere between two to four sieves, depending on how many continents the game loads. You're going to have people next to you, you're going to have space, but it's not going to be too much space. You will have to do a little bit of navy at some point. I think continents map gives us a really good indication of how well a sieve performs overall, generally speaking. So the naval sieves will have to do a little bit of land stuff, the land sieves will have to do a little bit of navy stuff. Speaking of, we are also assuming that maps are as they come. We are playing with average and unchanged settings. You can play an Inca map, for instance, and, you know, change it so that the map is incredibly hilly and full of mountains. Brilliant, wonderful, but that is a style of changing the map to suit you. I am doing this based on a map that is rolled randomly with the game's average layout. And going forward from that, I am also assuming that we are not endlessly re-rolling maps to get something that suits you. One of my big biggest pieces of advice is when you come to try and get better at Civ, play every game. I can guarantee the games that you lose, the games with terrible starts, the games where you have to fight against the odds that look stacked against you, unbeatable odds. Those are the ones that you will come away from and remember, and those are the ones that you will go, huh, 
I learnt a lot, and the way I look at Civ is kind of a little bit like that. We need a Civ that performs well in as many situations as possible. If a Civ, for instance, like we're gonna just re-roll a map 15 times to get that perfect continent split, for instance, or that perfect one to start, that's not a true representation of how that Civ is built. That's just a representation of how much you can generate a map that skews to the favor of that Civ. It's, it's not really the same thing as what we're going for here today. Couple of other useful comments, because this helps you to get into my mind. I value culture and faith quite highly compared to a lot of other YouTubers and players of Civ 6. I think that a lot of people focus on gold and science and production as three probably of the most important yields. I think a lot of people sleep on culture. It is amazing, for instance, how well you can go for a scientific victory if you rush down the culture tree to get your science cards and get to globalization really quickly. It's amazing how much your domination game can be helped by the unlocking of cores and armies really, really quickly, and the production cards like double naval capacity. It's amazing amazing that in all types of games, how much border growth in your cities can be one of those things that you don't realise you miss until you spend thousands of gold in a game buying tiles. A lot of people that struggle with deity sleep on culture and how good culture is. Even going through governments is a really important thing. I also think the same about faith. A lot of people don't realise how useful faith and having a religion generally is in Civ. It's so easy to ignore religions and to ignore faith and go, ah, oh, I'm just not going to bother with that aspect of the game today. And yes, you can win the game without faith and without religions. It's fine it's perfectly doable. But using your religion to give you yields and to generate pressure on the map and using your faith to buy units, buy great people, go for rock bands and naturalists and there's a hundred and one things that you can do with faith in a game. I'm not saying you have to focus on it as the primary aspect of your game but my guides involve that you are willing at least to use faith in some aspect be it making your own religion or having a religion spread to your lands and going you know what I like this this helps me and then adopting that religion as your own. You will have seen me on multiple occasions go, oh, you're going to spread feed the world to me, are you? I didn't have a religion. Now I'm going to use your religion. And then suddenly I'm building holy sites on turn 150. It's a very effective way of playing. Fans of the channel will also know that I am quite aggressive at Civ. When I build these guides, I am assuming that you are at least happy to go to war or to play slightly domination in all circumstances if you need to. I'm not saying you have to, but if you are a pacifist Civ player who only likes making cities, building beautiful empires and generally making a, a utopia. Good for you. I think that's really, really fun and I like playing that way myself. But this guide is a bit more balanced. This is assuming you are willing to do some combat if it is in your interest in a game or at the very least you're willing to seize on opportunities as they appear. And finally, a new rule that I'm adding uh, because this is relatively important. I am going to be judging civs as they run currently, not necessarily as the developers intend. As we go through the list, we will kind of come across a couple of civs at the very least that the description of how that civ is supposed to run and how the game intended for them to run may not be how they actually play. Now I am assuming at this point sat right now in the middle of April I do not think that we will be and I really hope I'm wrong on this I don't think we are going to see another major update for Civ 6 in some time. I think a lot of the balance and, and fix changes that a lot of people want to see we would be very lucky to get them. I think there's going to be a lot of attention from Firaxis on the new edition of Civ. So if the sieve isn't quite working properly, we just have to assume that's just what it is now and we'll run with that accordingly. A quick word as well on how I rate my tier list. Now a lot of people were slightly confused that I didn't do an S tier and then A through to F. There's a couple of reasons for that. I don't believe that an S tier and an F tier and all these sort of things saying a sieve is bad or good. That's not a very good way of looking at this because I honestly don't think that there is such a thing as a bad sieve in Civ 6. I don't think any of the sieves would have been released are actually detrimental to your game in any way. What I do believe, however, is that you've kind of got two different axes at the same time. You have whether a sieve could be considered to be better in terms of its potential. So for instance, what I do is I've got excellent, very good, and good as my three tiers of sieve. And then on the second axis, you have more of a reliability issue. Some sieves generally are in, and I kind of call this generally to be about 80 to 85% of games, they are reliable of that tier. So for instance, it is much more likely that you will get a spawn or a game that falls in a way that will get your sieve to play to its
its maximum potential. And remember, that's not rigged potential, that's maximum potential using all of the circumstances we've identified so far. Some of the sieves are what I would call situational. They can still be pretty good, but in order to get to the tier I've ranked them, they may need a little bit of help on the start. Say, for instance, a continent split, a good access to luxuries or city-states or whatever it may be. And I kind of intertwine the grades accordingly. So I would rate, for instance, a situationally excellent sieve to kind of be about the same as a generally very good sieve. I'd also rate a situationally very good sieve to be just about the same as a generally good sieve. So you can see these sieves on this tier, so from Cyrus through to Harambai, you've kind of got these sieves are kind of about the same tier for me as Macedon through to Vietnam. This bottom row of sieves probably doesn't play as well in terms of raw potential, but is very reliable, whereas these ones above might require a little bit more of luck to go your way, but can play better if they do. So really, I've kind of created a four tier system is kind of how I've gone. It goes from red to orange to yellow to green. I know it's not necessarily the best way of thinking about it, but it's how I play sieve. Some sieves are reliable, some sieves are good, some sieves are both, some sieves are neither. I also want to remind people about how tight I believe these bands to be. Now, this is going to be slightly funny how I put this, but I believe that if I, Ursa Ryan, were to play any one of the situationally good sieves on the bottom tier list, I believe that in 90 to 95% of games and cases, if I were to play somebody else playing Civ 6 from the community, I would win. No matter who they play, even if they played a generally excellent Civ, that's not to make me sound really smug or arrogant, which kind of does a little bit. It's more of a compliment to how Civ 6 works. I believe that actually the skill of the player is so much more important than the actual abilities of the Civ. Somebody who knows what they're doing can take Egypt or Poland or Ethiopia, for instance, and absolutely break the game with them compared to somebody playing Savia or Aztec or Hungary who doesn't know what they're doing. The skill difference in Civ is so much more important than the Civ difference. That's why I'm more reluctant to make an F tier or to slag any Civ off. I think they are all good in their own ways. They're all special and lovely in their own wonderful ways. So there we go, the rules as they play currently. I am not going to be going back through any of the Civs that I have ranked unless they go to the sieves that I'm going to be going through today. If you want to see my explanation and my reason for why I put any of these sieves into the tiers they're currently in, why don't you go and check out the previous tier list video because I went into like two hours of detail going through every single one and generally speaking I'm pretty happy with where this has fallen. Out of all of these I am going to make three adjustments. That's it. Three adjustments having played another 1500 hours of sieve and having done my A to Z there are three sieves I'm going to tweak. Everything else I'm pretty happy with. So remember, go check out the previous video if you want to see why I rated any of these sieves as I did. My first tweak, Macedon and Alexander the Great. Now, my biggest problem with Macedon has always been that the potential for the sieve is always outweighed by a bit of a early game limitation in getting them going. Macedon is a snowball sieve, being able to get all your Eure uh, Eurekas and all your inspirations and all that sort of stuff. Once they snowball, they really do snowball. And sometimes, yes, you have unique units, but when you're playing on Deity, Deity can often be so far ahead of you that getting that first couple of kills, it can be really tricky. Looking back, however, I really slept on how powerful Macedon was late game, especially when you're playing a scientific victory or a cultural victory. If you do late game domination, you, those Eurekas and Inspirations can hit into the spy techs really late into the game and can be incredibly helpful for you. Additionally, Venetian Arsenal Macedon is a hilarious broken format of Macedon where you can use boats to print production from your new unique uh, encampment building, the, the Pelades, and you can produce crazy amounts of science. You don't even need Venetian Arsenal to do it, although Venetian Arsenal does help. Just taking the double production card on any of the naval trees means that Macedon can reliably uh, produce a lot more science mid to late game than I had kind of given them credit for. So I'm going to move Macedon and the smiling Alexander from situationally very good to situationally excellent. I still think there is a certain amount of variance to do with who you spawn next to, the style of map you get, whether you have strategics or not. But if you get access to a decent enough spawn location where you can settle an empire and you can get at least a couple of cities on the coast to pump out boats, I think they are brilliant. Secondly, I, and I think this was one of the more controversial choices I'd picked originally, I'm going to change Cree and Pound 
sound makeup from situationally good to generally good. It's only a small tweak. I'm still not a huge fan of how the Kree play. I still think that their bonuses are fun, but not particularly game breaking. It's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Again, I know I like a well-rounded sieve, but it feels like everything is just a little bit underwhelming. However, I did sleep a little bit on how good the Mecha app is. Their unique improvement gives a lot of production, a lot of housing, and it can be put pretty much anywhere. Late game, it is also really good. The Creek can build some very big cities. Yeah, they're a bit more reliable than I thought they were. They are a bit better than I thought they were. I was underplaying how powerful that unique improvement was. I still don't think they're going to be up here, but I will admit that they are a little bit higher than I initially put them. Finally, as well, I'm going to do a little bit of a tweak to Old Cyrus of Persia. Now, I always have had a little bit of a problem with Persia because I just, again, feel like the power creep in the game. Some of the newer sieves are a little bit better than some of the older sieves, and Persia kind of lost out a little bit on that. I also didn't think Cyrus's ability was very good. However, I then played a couple games with them, and I kind of see what they're about a little bit more. It's about taking advantage of opportunities, surprise wars. It sounds ridiculous. Don't need to be made against the person you're actually fighting. You can start declaring wars against people that are on the other side of the world to get your movement bonus. And having your movement bonus on things like siege weapons, gaining momentum. The game we played with them was absolutely ridiculous. I think that they're probably a little bit better than I had put them. So I'm going to move them from generally good to situationally very good. If things line up in your favor, there's a couple of good targets and you can get a snowball going. I think Persia are probably a little bit better than I thought they were initially. That said, I still don't think they're going to trouble the upper ranks of some of these sieves. But that's it. I'm kind of still happy with how everything else sits. So we are not going to go into anything else here. Let's start by going through Leader Pass 1. First of all, we have Julius Caesar, Mr. Shoulder Pads himself. That The model of this leader just took everyone by surprise. This was the alternative Rome leader introduced as long as you linked your account to the 2K account. And the fun thing, and we're going to see this in a lot of the different Leader Pass leaders, that are brought out is that you have to remember what were the Rome bonuses and what were the leader bonuses because all of these are new leaders on sieves that have existed before. We're also going to be seeing a lot of direct comparison to previous leaders. So for instance, Julius is going to get connected and compared, I would say, to Trajan. Instead of having a free monument or city center building every time you found a city, Caesar gets a lump sum of gold every time you conquer a city or whenever you clear a barbarian outpost. So it pays to go aggressive. You want to be using all of your legion, all of your trade routes to generate as much gold as you can to raise an army, slam it into somebody near you, do a bit of conquering, get some gold, and then use that gold to make other army. And this is kind of where Caesar's ability really lies. It encourages you to clear out barbarian outposts, which is a good thing because it stops you from having barbarian issues and it means that your map is nice and protected. Although the problem that Caesar has is that you don't have any advantages against killing barbarians, but you know, you've got civics for that, so it's not too bad. But it also encourages you to go very aggressive very early on, because 200 gold at the beginning of the game is a decent chunk of gold. It's not game breaking, but it certainly is useful when you are taking over an enemy civilization. Deity Civ means that when you are ready to attack, they probably will have at the very minimum four cities, more like five to six. If you were attacking in the sort of mid to late class classical era of the game. So that's upwards of about a thousand gold you can claim from conquering a sieve, as well as, of course, then you have the cities. The biggest criticism of Caesar is that that gold doesn't scale until you get to steel. Steel is well into the late stages of the game. It's up by battleships, so we're talking very late game, modern era attack, I think. So this 200 gold starts quite useful and it gets quite quickly less useful until you go to steel, in which case it gets useful again, but then late game, you know, you could be producing 500 gold per turn at that quite easily. So you start to lean on your legion a little bit more, your baths, which will give you lots of amenities. You've got obviously your trade routes from uh, your cities can travel further and may produce more gold. So there's a lot of good stuff in Rome, but the criticism is just that this gold isn't meaningful. I think Caesar is one of these leaders that you have to get your head around 
around them because you're not using your gold to do game-changing things. You can't generate like entire swathes of infrastructure in your capital. You can't really buy settlers. You can't really levy much in the way of city-states, all that sort of stuff. What it does do, especially when you hit the mercenary civic slightly into the medieval era, you can make sure that any warriors in your empire are being promoted to legion. This is one of the most advantageous things that Caesar can do. You make a couple of legion, you use those legion to chop out because they have one charge that is supposed to be building a fort, but you can just, of course, put them to chop some wood or some stone or whatever it is in your capital or whatever city you're building Caesar legions in and use them to chop out other legions or other warriors if you don't have much iron and then you use this gold to promote the units you've got to make more legions or maybe to convert your legions into mana arms or whatever it may be and you keep the snowball going. It takes a little bit of time but Caesar can be incredibly powerful. That said because the gold isn't as big a deal as it could be like a lot of the mods that change Caesar kind of introduce a sort of time element to this so it gives you a certain amount of gold and then for every era that passes you get a bit more gold or, or whatever like there are ways you could make this ability a lot better but it definitely is a snowball ability compared to for instance a monument which gives you just a chunk of culture and helps the early game progression to rush you towards that government Trajan's ability is very powerful and very reliable this one's a bit more erratic but it can produce some amazing early game results especially when you chain it together with a good old-fashioned legion rush you've got to make sure you have iron but if you can get it Caesar is very powerful. Now I originally rated Trajan as generally very good because of his reliability. I know that my opinion on this is a little bit uh, against the flow of everybody else's. I think Caesar has the potential, much more potential, to start to snowball early in the game and to build a very aggressive, very good conquest-based empire for you. That 200 gold is very helpful. So if I was going to kind of put them near Trajan, I would say that they have more of potential to be excellent rather rather than very good, but it is a situational thing. There are spawning things, you do want to get a little bit of iron, you want to have a little bit of a good neighbor, you do need a little bit of luck, but Caesar actually has a lot of potential in this. Next up, it's Abraham Lincoln of America. Uh, this is a alternative leader to the two teddies. Instead of science and culture, or maybe even combat strength on your own continent, Abraham Lincoln has a very funny set of abilities. <laughs> very funny. Industrial zones give free loyalty per turn, but plantations give minus two loyalty per turn. I will tell you now, it is very, very unlikely that that minor amount of loyalty is going to be enough to either keep or lose a city. It may be. Maybe if you've got a city right on the frontier and you have like seven plantations in it, it could be a problem. But these are very small loyalty adjustments. If you, for instance, look at the fact that a governor in a city gives seven loyalty and a lot of other cards within your empire, like even happiness can give plus three or minus three. It's a small amount. You're not really going to be talking about that one very much. Really, the kind of main bit about Lincoln is the following. Receive a 3 mil a unit after constructing industrial zones and their buildings. And their buildings being the important thing there. If I make an industrial zone, I get a 3 mil a unit. I then get another 3 mil a units if I put a workshop, a factory, and a power plant in that industrial zone. So there is a chance per city of 4 3 mil a units. To make it even better, it does not require resources when created this 3 unit. And by that, it means oil. So once you get past line inventory, the inventory upgrade and the mechanized inventory upgrades both require oil per turn to maintain. Your three units do not. That's really handy. No CO2, no diplo favor penalty, and more importantly, if you don't have strategics, that can help to actually keep a quite decent army. And those three units have plus five combat strength. Plus five combat strength is handy. It's not enough to write home about. It's not game changing, but it is very useful. Abraham Lincoln, in my eyes, is not designed to be a domination sieve. America's abilities are very generic. They have a little bit of culture, a little bit of domination, a little bit of diplomacy. Wildcard governments can kind of give you a flexibility to play the game in any way you want. That's kind of the advantage of America, very flexible. I see Abraham Lincoln as a way of making sure that your empire is industrialized. Industrial zones are still to this day one of the best zones that you can get in 
in your empire and you always want to be focusing on them to an extent. What this Emancipation Proclamation does for you is that when you are sim sitting or when you are building your civ and its industry, you will produce three units as you go. It means that you will always have a very significant defensive force and that defensive force will kind of stay pace with you. So as you go through the game, you'll be spawning swordsmen or maybe even man at arms or muskets or line inventory or inventory or whatever it is, you will keep spawning better and better and better units. Defensively, it helps. If you are playing a domination game, you're still going to need your air force, you're still going to need your navy, you're still going to need all your siege equipment, but having inventory and having melee units generally is a very handy thing. And that combat strength, well, that will help you to protect yourself from city attacks, from ranged attacks, it means you're harder to kill. And you can still make armies and cores out of that three units. So it, generally speaking, it's quite a strong ability. There is also the one thing that we do need to talk about, which is, of course, the Lincoln bug. There is still a bug in this game, to my knowledge, where once you have built the power plant in the city, you will receive, uh, I think it's as soon as you unlock your second power plant. So if you've got a coal and an oil power plants unlocked, for instance, if you run the change power plant project, so for instance, if you've got coal and then you change it to an oil power plant or vice versa, nuclear power plants obviously being another option, the game thinks you've built a new power plant and will give you another three units. So in theory, just cycling between those projects will give you endless three units. Now, the problem is that project still is quite productive. It, it's cheaper than building a unit. So they are cheaper and you'll still get plus five combat strength with no resource requirement. However, it does still take quite a lot of production to do that. And you still have to pay the army maintenance on the units as well. So there is still a gold cost. But late game, there is quite a fun thing where you can be spawning essentially endless inventory and mechanized inventory armies just by pumping these units out and out and out and out and out. Is it a bug? Nah, it's a feature at this point and we have to make sure that Lincoln has that. So the question is, where do I think that Lincoln fits into the tree? Now, we originally put Bull Moose Teddy. Where are you? Here he is, situationally very good. And we put Rough Rider Teddy as generally very good. America's abilities are quite versatile, but not really kind of pointing towards any particular victory type over another. The flexibility is the advantage, really. I still believe that Bull Moose's ability to get crazy amounts of science and culture from a very early point in the game. Even settling your city can give you a city center with all of those bonuses. You know, situationally, this is a very broken sieve. I think that Bulmos is still more powerful, but I wouldn't say that Lincoln was worse than Rough Rider Teddy. Yeah, the combat bonus that Rough Rider Teddy gets and the Rough Rider unit generally, those are very powerful. The ability to grab envoys and city states is still very powerful. However, I do think the amount of three army that Lincoln can produce Produced defensively means that Lincoln is generally, I would say, probably in the same breath, very similar to Rough Rider. Again, I think the, the, the general conversation is how much you like America's abilities without the sieves. This is why I kind of have them a little bit further down. Lincoln's a good sieve, probably equal to Rough Rider, but I don't think better than Bullmoose. Reliable though, that's why generally good. I think building an industrial zone is something you should do in every game and producing units, always going to be handy. Next up, we have the newest leader of the Congo, Nzinga Mbade. When she was released, one of the most anticipated leaders on the past because a lot of people wanted Congo to get a new breath of life and oh my goodness, did she provide that. Now the actual Congo abilities, the ability to put food, production, faith and gold on relics, artifacts and sculptures, as well as giving you more artist, musician, merchant points and a palace with five slots for great works. When you combine that with the Mbanza district, very cheap, very reliable, providing food and gold regardless of appeal, and a very decent swordsman, which won't break the game, but is still very useful. Congo was one of the strongest sieves anyway. So now we put on the ability of Nzinga. Cities receive 10% yields if on the same continent as your capital, including your capital, minus 15% if on another continent. Now this is a very similar ability to Lady Six Guy, but instead of being within six tiles of your capital, one of the most infuriating limitations in the entirety of six, uh, Civ 6, in my opinion, this is now on the same continent as your capital, which leads to a big limitation. How lucky are you going to get with the map? Sometimes a continent can be massive. Sometimes a continent
continent can be less than massive. Does minus 15% to all yields limit you from settling or expanding outside of your continent? No, absolutely not. If you need a strategic, if you need luxury, you can still go and get it. If you want to go domination, you can still go domination. However, minus 15% on all yields is terrifyingly bad, as well as 10% on all yields being very, very useful. That's like Scotland's ability for production and science, regardless of happiness. And you also get it to gold and culture and faith, and more importantly, city growth. So growth is one of the things that you also get. Now combine that with the food from relics, and Zynga can have one of the fastest starts in the game. You can build huge cities, like population 50 cities with Pingala in them, producing terrifying yields. This has quickly become one of those sieves that under the AI, you just get spectacular results. So if you have her as an opponent, never very fun. Playing her is obviously a lot of fun. I still think there are a lot of map limitations, but the map limitations are a lot less than, for instance, with Lady Six Sky. Some of the problems you have settling on your own continent is you do become a little bit reliant on city-states and trade for other luxuries. Remember, luxuries do get spawned on a per-continent basis. And sometimes, let's face it, your continent can just be a bit naff. But with a fairly accurate and fairly reliable rainforest spawn, you often get very good yields. I am a big fan of this leader. Now, I put original Congo as generally very good and I think that the new leader is better. I think she is an excellent sieve. I think the ability to produce some very powerful games is is very impressive. Do I put her as generally excellent though or situationally excellent? The reason I don't think she quite makes it to this top tier is that there is an element of unreliability in her spawn. If you get a small continent or if for instance just very simply you have a game with no relics, no matter what you do, candy's not in the game, no relic spawn, the AI refused to pick up any. You're waiting a little bit until sculptures uh, later into the game to get those bonuses, artifacts as well. It all comes online but you just have to wait a little bit for that. So in order to get the snowball it is a little bit more situational on a good start. However, I still think she is an excellent sieve. So I would put her in the top category for power. I just think there's a little bit of unreliability to her gameplay compared to some of the other sieves above. Still, a very welcome improvement on original Congo. And then we have Sultan Saladin of Arabia, a replacement for now Visor Saladin of Arabia. Instead of being able to purchase your faith building for a outrageously small amount of faith uh, and then that giving you science, faith and culture in your cities, instead now you receive plus 100% flanking and support bonuses to all combat and religious units. Sultan Saladin is one of those sieves that you have to get good at the game to really, really appreciate how good they can be. Flanking and support bonuses can be huge. Uh, I believe the maximum flanking and support bonus you can get is about plus 12 if you had every single tile surrounded. I think practically though, it's plus 10. So having up to a plus 10 combat bonus means that if you are playing a domination game or a religious game, the fact that this also applies to religious units, it means that your apostles, your military units, they can have very, very good combat bonuses. You do, however, need to learn to use flanking and support bonuses. Combine those bonuses, however, with great people or with policy cards or governments or whatever technological advantage you can get from still having the last profit, having extra science from spreading probably what will be a crusade religion if you go on the offensive or just a general religion if you're going for a religious victory. Combine that with your unique university your powerful units. Yeah, you know what? Weirdly enough, whilst I think the Visor Saladin was much more of a sit back and enjoy religious scientific SimCity game with Arabia was fun, this is a much more go and get them ability. You have to play on the offensive a little bit more. Go and seek that religious victory. Go and conquer your neighbours. Take over that city state. Whatever it might be, you have to actually go and do things to appreciate this, whereas Visor's ability is a little bit more sort of waiting around. That's said, orchestrating the perfect flanking and support bonus in AI combat can be a little bit tricky. It's much easier than doing it in multiplayer. I think multiplayer combat can be just chaotic at the very, very best of times. 
In single player, you actually have the time to use your cavalry to move around units and to get these combat and support bonuses. It can be a very, very fiddly job, however. Getting this leader to work is just a logistical effort, and you just need to put the effort in. If you do put the effort in, you will receive a lot of bonuses, and, and the bonuses you get can go from another plus two to plus ten in all combat situations as long as you send your units out in groups. However, compared to somebody like Gaul would be a good uh, comparison because if we remember Gaul gets a combat bonus just for having adjacent units we cannot deny that this ability is just a tad fiddly to use and that's gonna impact my rating now generally Arabia I put as generally good because having a religion if you're guaranteed a religious uh, apostle or a great prophet I should say and then getting science and faith and culture from that yeah you can generally guarantee that that gives you a good bonus and with a good campus building Arabia is always gonna have a good game however instead of just receiving a blanket 10% bonus to your cities you now have to go and get your stuff and especially in early game combat Arabia can find themselves without much of an advantage so whilst I still believe Arabia is a good sieve I would say that unfortunately this new version of Arabia is situationally good as opposed to generally good you have to go out and do the work and you have to hope you have a little bit of a spawn that lets you do that but yeah it's still a good sieve I still like playing Arabia. In terms of their power level, I think they're down on good. I still really enjoy playing Arabia. They're very suited to me. But yeah, you, I mean, the, the good example would be comparing them to somebody like Gaul, comparing them to someone like Mongolia or Byzantium. Yeah, Arabia just doesn't have that combat strength bonus that they kind of need. Next up, we have Nader Shah of Persia. Now, 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 now. Persia, we know that I don't think that Persia is the best civilization in terms of its abilities with satrapies, immortal, the unique building. I think they have a place and they are decent. There's a lot of gold potential. There's a lot of culture adjacency and culture potential. Immortals being cheaper and having a ranged attack does make them quite versatile units. However, I do think that Persia itself has suffered a little bit from power creep in the latest releases of civs it doesn't quite match up to some of the more powerful abilities i'm not saying it's useless it's just one of those things that doesn't really sing too much and i think cyrus definitely the fall of babylon this movement speed bonus the potential to snowball with it and the potential to move all of your siege equipment around so quickly that is really handy the also ability to pillage it that's really handy instead nada shah brings the sword of persia which is five combat strength when attacking full health units and then sitting is not founded by Nader Shah, so either you've traded, gained them from liberating a three city or by conquering, receive two faith and three gold on domestic trade routes. Now don't forget, we also have two gold and one culture for domestic trade routes down here. So in theory, domestic trade routes involving a city that isn't yours gain two faith, five gold and one culture. So a little bit of synergizing. As it reads, it's not the best ability. It's kind of the opposite to Tamiris' ability where you get combat strength when you're attacking injured units it's only units at full strength so you get one good pop and then that's it so you have to make sure you're kind of using your units in a sort of sensible way it's a little fiddly but you can get the hang of it it also means that at some point in order to get the rest of his ability you need to have gained a city yourself however we are judging the civs as they played not as how the developers intended there are two other things that happen with Nada Shah firstly you know that bit that says cities not founded by Nada Shah well they did didn't implement that so this two faith and three gold is on all domestic trade routes all the time i don't think that's been patched I'm, I'm i'm almost certain it hasn't been patched and i don't think it will be patched just purely because i don't believe that there is going to be a significant patch coming through before the next game so that five gold two faith and one culture on domestic trade routes that is handy now you do need to manipulate your cities a little bit to get a bit of a trading nexus so making use of things like the diplomatic plaza and the government square making sure your cities have a lot of districts maybe putting Magnus in a city but then your domestic trade routes can throw lots of production lots of food as well as all of these yields again the problem is power creep even Tokugawa for instance or for instance Spain Portugal there, there are a lot of bonuses you can get on internal trade routes and all of them are better than this however it is still quite handy the other thing is that this five combat strength attacking full health units well 
well, for whatever reason, the way they've coded it, a city always counts as a full strength unit. Why? I don't know. Maybe it was like a sort of not gate in the logic processing of it. They were like, well, is it a unit with full, like without full health? And, and because a city isn't a unit, it just triggers. I don't know. But all of your equipment, siege weapons, melee, ranged, naval units, whatever it is, they all get five combat strength when attacking cities at all points. That is very handy. Very handy for jet bombers. Very handy for siege equipment. If you get crusade like I did in my game, even handier. So all in all, there are some useful benefits here. When we compare it to Cyrus, I think that this movement bonus, it's a little bit fiddlier to use, but the potential for being just broken in the game is so much more. I think the Sword of Persia is a bit more of a reliable ability. You do need to do a bit of conquering to get it, and definitely Nardashar isn't the best conquering Civ. But there's a lot of culture and gold um, production here that should help your economy, especially if you become a bit of a pariah on the world. Your domestic trade routes are pretty decent. So I would say that this Persia is just generally a little bit better in terms of being generally good. But is it better overall? I don't know. I think, oh, like situationally versus generally. I do think this is a generally good Civ. It's whether or not Nadashar is a good or very good. When I look at some of the civs that could be compared to or very good compared to generally good, for me, I think Nardashar is generally good. I still, I quite like how they play, but a, a power creep with Persia, the leader ability isn't quite enough to push it into the higher stages of the game, for, for me personally. And now we look at Tokugawa of Japan, and this sort of puts my context for Nardashar's Persia in a little bit here, because I was saying about power creep, I was saying how the abilities were good, but they didn't really get as much done as you'd want. When we look at Tokugawa, you'll see why. So you get to keep pretty much all of the good stuff of Japan in the Meiji Restoration, where you get standard adjacencies on all districts. That's really cool. Electronics factories are very handy. Samurai are very powerful. But now we have Bakahan, which means that international trade routes are pants. They receive minus 25% yield and tourism. Remember, that's both ways. So if you have a democratic or Visselbanken policy carded ally, and they send you a trade Trade route, it gives you 25% less. So it works in both directions. It's just worth remembering. Doesn't play well with others. However, domestic trade routes receive one culture, one science, and two gold for every specialty district at the destination. Remember what I was just saying about Nardashar and Persia? When you have domestic trade routes, you need to make sure that you have a magna city with surplus logistics. You need to make sure you've got the diplomatic quarter, the government plaza. By the way, I, I will interchangeably change quarter, square, and plaza. I can never remember what combination it is. You need to make sure that the city has all of the districts so that your domestic trade routes are as good as possible. But we have seen in games this gets silly. You could easily, by the medieval era, easily by the medieval era, have five culture, five science, ten gold trade routes. Compared to the, Tukka, to the, to the Persian trade routes we were just talking about, you can see that these are so much better. Being honest with you, cities within six tiles of your capital are 100% loyal. S situationally, that would be a little bit useful, but I've yet to see a real situation where it is very useful, unless you're on the most cramped maps. And flight, receiving one tourism for every district, again, that that extra tourism you get will not compensate for minus 25% yield on your trade routes. That is a flat 25% trade boost on your tourism number. And if you want to be getting a culture victory, your tourism number needs to be a lot bigger than one tourism for every district. It needs to be upwards of sort of 1,500, 2,000 tourism per turn at a very minimum. And that 25% bonus on that will be upwards of 500 tourism per turn. Way more, way more than this flight bonus is. So yeah, like Tokugawa is not a very good culture sieve, but I cannot stress how powerful these trade routes are. Just by setting up sort of four or five cities with harbors and commercial hubs and having them all in, you can get like easily to 100 science per turn reliably by turn 100. You can easily get to 100 culture per turn by turn 100. Very, very powerful. And more importantly, it makes all of your little cities, your minor cities, able to draw food and production from your trading city. Very strange way to play Tokugawa, but comparing it to Divine Wind with a little bit of combat bonuses and some fast district building, for me, these abilities are as good, if not better. There's a debate as to who is better and I think it's a little bit of uh, your personal preference on how you play. Hojo is a little bit more about getting those districts down. Tokugawa, you want your districts but it's more about getting them in a centralized place but they're both very very strong. Now for me Japan was generally excellent. They were in my top tier and Tokugawa was easy. T Tokugawa is going straight up here. For me 
I think as good or better than original Japan, straight up to generally excellent, and I think that's pretty accepted to be one of the more fun civs to play from the leader's pass. One of my favourites. By the way, if you are still learning civ, and you want to practice beating deity, and you want to practice uh, the kind of art of building cities, and working on domestic trade routes, and how to play a more isolated game, Tokugawa is your man. Have a go, you will not regret it. And now we move to the Ottomans, and we have a new version of Suleiman, the Magnificent. I have to be a little bit careful here, I am a little bit biased. Ottomans are one of my favourite civs in the game. Just all of this alone. 50% production towards siege units, that is one of the few things in the game that gives you production towards siege units. 5 extra strength against districts for siege units, really powerful, means your catapults and your trebuchets and your bombards can be very powerful. Conquered cities do not lose population, that is huge. That is huge, you take a 10 population city and for everybody else it would transfer to you with maybe the 6 or 7 population. You get to keep all 10, which means that the city is more productive, it means that it's more loyal, it exerts loyalty pressure, and more importantly, it has the capacity to continue building districts quicker without having to get food recovery. And that's before we get the fact that if you conquer a city, it gains 1 immunity and 4 loyalty per turn, even if you don't even have any units in it. Ottomans are one of the best domination civs, if not the best domination civ, I think that's debatable, Byzantium is right up there, but Ottomans are amazing. Barbary Corsa is one of the best boats in the game, having no movement cost on coastal raiding, Trust me, that will give you so much yield if the AI has made the mistake of putting any district on the coast. One or two of these boats can sweep an entire coastline in like three turns. So powerful. Grand Bazaar as well. A lot of amenities. People sleep on how good this building is. Very powerful. So you know I like the Ottomans. However, how do the two differ? So we lose the unique governor, which is a, a real shame because that unique gov get a governor gave uh, 10 combat strength against cities. It was very, very powerful. As well as other bits and pieces that were useful but the 10 combat strength was definitely the most powerful bit. And the Janissary, very, very powerful unit. Now the loss of Janissaries, that's painful. It's one of the better unique units. On top of Barbary Corsa, a very powerful unit, very strong musketman, incredibly cheap to build, incredibly cheap strategically to build on resources, and you get a free promotion. I, I am all about these units, so we are losing a lot. However, instead, we have a few things. We have the second half of the ability, which I like to call the leg up ability. If you're not in a Golden Age or Heroic Age, you get four combat strength against other civilizations, also not in a Golden Age or Heroic Age. Now, this is a little bit, you know, finickety, but it's a leg up. If you're not in a Golden Age, you need to do some domination. You need to go take people over. And now, if you attack somebody that isn't in a Golden Age, you have four combat strength, plus five combat strength, there's nine combat strength on your siege equipment against their cities. It helps. Don't forget, taking over cities will massively help to push you up with era score. You get 5 era score from conquering a civilization entirely. And there's all kinds of military based era score things that you can get as well. So it's very, very handy. However, the meat of the ability is at the top. If you are in a golden or heroic age, so you need to be good at managing your golden ages, but you should be able to if you're playing on deity, you get 15% extra science and culture. That is big, big, big. That is on all of your cities. That is regardless of what they're doing. If you've got a Pingala city with a campus and a theatre square, brilliant. If you don't and you're just conquering cities, 15% science and culture. That's huge. Is the Magnificent as good a domination sieve as Grand Vizier? No, no. Original Grand Vizier Suleiman is better as a domination sieve. The Magnificent, however, is less good at domination, but oh my goodness, when you pick up a few cities, that bonus, yeah, you're, you're absolutely laughing thing and then you'll be technologically ahead and then you won't need that 10 combat strength from the Janissaries because you're going to have aeroplanes. As soon as the Magnificent gets bombers, you are sorted. Like you have won the game. It's like so powerful. I'll be honest with you, the leader ability is kind of negligible compared to the Ottoman ability. The actual Ottoman ability down at the bottom is really powerful. Is the Magnificent as good as the Grand Vizier? Eh, it's debatable. I've seen people argue it either way and I'd be happy with either outcome. I'm going to say they are different but similar. Similar, but I have original Ottomans generally excellent, and I think I I can't see any reason not to put new Ottomans also as generally excellent. 
such a powerful combination of leader and sieve really fun to play so effective i this is one of my favorite new additions in the leader pack alongside takagawa they did a really good job here and onwards to china i'm gonna have to get my pronunciation book out i'm so sorry it's been a little while first of all we're going to have a look at Wu Chen. now there are five different china leaders now and you've got to remember that the actual ability for china for all five of them is exactly the same in china again one of the more powerful abilities in the game having 10 percent extra boost on eurekas and inspirations is a big deal if you complete a wonder you get another boost of each uh, depending on the era of the wonder again big deal crouching tigers great defensive unit not so good at offense but very good a uh, great wall is a fantastic way of getting a lot of early game culture and gold you can use it defensively but really the yields that you get post i think castles it just gets really good it's actually a very very good unique improvement and this is where the power creep comes in a little bit i know china came into the game before persia but the great wall is just a better version of the persian unique uh, improvement like it really is and and this stacks so you can put it next to each other uh, and make sort of fairly useless things like desert and tundra you can make it pretty decent so i like china china itself is pretty decent so the leader again doesn't need to be hugely powerful however wu Chen has manual of entrapment all offensive spies operate at one level higher so as long as you are doing shenanigans with your spies they count as being one promotion higher than they are brilliant the worst that spies can be is level one and they will never be at level one so the chances of them being captured or killed is very very low especially if you get sources in a city uh, where your offensive missions will then be two levels higher again you can get almost indestructible spies literally from the beginning of the game you get a three spy and a spy capacity after discovering defensive tactics so that's quite early in the game that's late classical era civic so not too bad earlier than anybody else more importantly and you gain 50 percent of the culture and the science that the targeted city earned during that turn if you complete an offensive spy mission an offensive spy mission is pretty much anything that targets the city detrimentally so i believe gain sources and the diplomatic visibility ones don't give you that ability but things like industrial sabotage spaceport sabotage gold theft great work theft all that stuff will give you that bonus now Wu Chan is a leader that you need to be good at spies so uh, for me personally i don't use spies anywhere near as much as i should i know that i'm taking that into account when i do my tier list i'm not allowing her to be marked down for the fact that i don't use spies very often however when i played her man your spies are effective just the gold pillaging alone if you get a good target you can take thousands of gold every few turns 50 percent of the culture and the science of the target city is actually less than you think the ai is not very good at focusing science and culture in one city and it takes the amount the city earns before the deity bonuses as well to my knowledge so that 50 percent culture and science really won't give you enough it's enough to give you like little bits and pieces here and there like uh, obviously three culture and science at any point is lovely but that won't win you the game the fact is you have an extra spy and the spies are more effective at missions if you get machiavellianism in and if you get the intelligence agency your spies are pretty much unkillable is she very good compared to other leaders debatable spies are very effective but they're not going to win you the game as much as people say they will win you the game they won't they simply fill in gaps but if you are technologically behind you can be using them for instance to steal tech eurekas and the eurekas give you more technology because of dynastic cycle and you also then get culture and science from those boosts as well there are some tactics with wuzi chen which are very powerful more importantly she's one of the more fun people to play i would recommend and this this pink is a savage pink i love it it's all about placing her though so i have two versions of china on my grid already i have situationally very good uh, original china with Quinchy. Wonder building at the beginning of the game situationally is very very good if you can get some good builders you know you can snowball really really well but the ability tends to uh, you know trail off very quickly into the game. I like Kublai. I think Kublai is a better leader. I know I am uh, I, I am not the popular opinion on that one but you cannot sleep on anybody that gives you three boosts of traders. I know that it's difficult to get them because you're not Mongolia like you have to complete the trade route but a three economic policy card as well like oh kublai is actually pretty good i would agree that wu Chen is no worse so she is a very good leader again because china is very good 
but I would say she's probably situationally very good over generally very good. It's difficult to argue otherwise. You need to have a good person to spy on. You need to make sure that you're not reliant on being allied to them and kind of her abilities are better the further behind you are. So she's quite a good catching up person. Like you can't get many Eurekas if you've already researched those things yourself. So I'm going to pop her into situationally very good. I still think she is very good. Next up though, we're going to look at the new version of Quinchi. Instead of Mandate of Heaven, we now have Unifier. And not just 36 stratagems, but they're all interesting to use. This is what I would like to call the viral meme leader out of all of them. We've all seen the videos people like Bothius and Spiffing Brit have made fantastic videos where you use this ability to win you the game without settling cities. I love it. Like the fun of this leader is right up there. All melee units receive the, car, the Convert Barbarians action. So this is the Apostle action where you basically burn a charge and any Barbarians around your melee unit are instantly converted to your civilization. However, once the charges are removed, the melee unit also is removed. I actually think, I have a sneaking suspicion that because they borrowed the Apostle promotion, an Apostle is used to deleting themselves after you get to zero charges. I don't think this was a feature. I think this was something they coded in and the melee unit deleted itself after losing all its charges because it counted as an apostle charge and they never got around to fixing it or couldn't work out how to fix it. I, I honestly think that's what that part is about. I, like I don't believe that was a deliberate balancing thing. But the fact that you remove your melee unit is annoying. Take a warrior, steal a warrior and a slinger from barbarians, you've only up one slinger for instance. So you've got to make sure you're fighting barbarians, you've got to make sure your unit is powerful enough to survive the barbarians and and you've got to make sure that you catch enough units in your entrapment to make it worth it. I am all for the fun and games of Unifier Quinn, but but, 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 is it any good? It is debatable. I, I, I think pragmatically the actual general ability in an average game is opportunistic at best. And I know, I know the potential is there. I understand that potential is there. There are situations where it could be incredibly powerful, but we're talking about, th like this is the definition of a situational leader. You need the map to fold in your favor and the barbarians to affect your playstyle. And without game modes on, with a standard map, it, it's very tricky to do. A lot of the playstyles that make Unifier work well include zombies or barbarian clans. Take those off. Not so powerful. Now there is a little bit of a shout out to make. If you have, I think, which is it? The Hagia Sophia? The wonder that gives all of your apostles one extra uh, charge. It actually applies to all of your melee units as well. Again, this is kind of what makes me think the removing melee unit is a thing. So if you get this uh, wonder, you do have more flexibility. But again, situational. You have to actually get the wonder, which means you have to have a religion I believe. A little bit tricky but it is possible. But let's think about this. Is this a situational or a general good leader? Absolutely the definition of a situationally good leader. Do I think that this version of Quinchi matches up with the original one? No. Building wonders is and having builder charges is so much better. So much better and you lose so much. I actually think that we unfortunately are right down here with situationally good. It is a big big drop I think literally the China abilities are all you were relying on with this leader. I wanted him to be better. I think if your units didn't remove themselves from the game, they would be a lot better. Or if there was a two tile radius on the conversion, again, I think that would be better. But alas, uh, they, they are what they are. Very, very fun though. Very, very fun to play. I will not take that away from them. And finally, we have the last Chinese leader added in the past, Yong Le. Now, now, now we get into the territory of a leader with an ability that adds and improves on China's already amazing abilities. All cities receive projects so they can convert 50% of their production into food, faith, or 100% if it's gold. That production into food means that you can turbocharge early city growth and then use your gold and your faith to be buying things around it. And that's very important because cities with 10 population or more, so it has to be a minimum of 10 population, receive, and this is where it gets silly, two gold, one science, and one culture per turn for each population in the city. And that applies to any city at 10 population or above. So a 10 population city will gain you 20 gold, 10 science, and 10 culture per turn. 
Let me just tell you how ridiculous this is. A promoted Rainer financier governor will give you two gold per population in the city. A promoted Pingala will give you one science per population in the city or a culture per population of the city. This ability gives you all three of those in any city that goes to 10 population. Oh, and you're having problems getting your city 10 population? That's fine. Convert your production into food. And don't forget, if your cities are happy, for instance, or maybe you have Kilwa, or another wonder that increases science or production or gold across your empire, maybe even policy cards. Well, that all gets multiplied into the city production. This, my friends, is one of the strongest abilities in Civ currently at the moment. Every single one of your cities can become a double promoted Pingala and promoted Reina city, and it can get itself to that situation. And don't forget, you can put Pingala or Reina in the city after that again. So just to put it in context, let's say I get my capital to population 10 and I stick Pingala with the promotions to give myself science and culture per citizen. I've also got the promotion that gives me 15% extra science and culture because that's just what Pingala does. Without any happiness and without any other districts, 10 population will give me 20 gold per turn, 23 science per turn and 23 culture per turn. And then you get extra for the population itself. So the actual population will give you another five science that's then to 5.75. And the culture would be about four culture. Like, yeah, Yonglei is just amazing. You have to make sure your cities get to 10 population. But if you do, they will swell to the most scientific and cultural cities that have amazing tile accumulation. Like if you get a city to 10 population, it's earning 10 culture per turn. You will you will gobble up tiles faster than even Estadio de Maracana. That gives six culture per turn. This is 10. When used right, the sheer yields you can produce from this ability are just astronomical. One of my favorite leaders of the game, brilliant not only for Conquest but also for SimCity games. If you haven't played Yonglei and you can, do it. You will not regret it. It's such a reliable ability. It is a general ability, not a situational ability. It's not very good. It's excellent. He goes straight up here without hesitation. Leader pass number four and we're off to Egypt and the Sahara and we're going to start with Ramses the second. Now Egypt. Egypt, 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 Egypt. Production towards districts and wonders if placed next to a river. It's useful, but it's not crazy powerful. And no damage from floods. Again, it's useful if you're on floodplain, but it's not going to break the game for you. The Chariot Archer is actually pretty useful. The ability to have four movement and then also fire is just very, very good. And the Sphinx, again, it's one of those things that gives you a little bit of faith, gives you a little bit of culture. It helps you with appeal, which can be worked into preserve builds, which we'll uh, get to in a second. But the raw abilities of it are kind of like if you compare this to the improvement, like the open air theater for Sweden or even the Great Wall we've just discussed with China. Yeah. This, this doesn't really hold up. It's why original Egypt uh, Mediterranean's Bride kind of suffered in my last tier layer rating. I think I had them pretty much at the bottom. So Ramses needs to bring something else. Gain culture equal to 15% of the construction cost when finishing buildings and 30% when completing wonders. Now to put that in context, I think the biggest wonder in the game is just over 2000 production. So the most you can get from that ability is about 600 culture in one go. Pretty decent. Say you had a building towards the end of the game, like a coal power plant or a broadcast center or something like that. Maybe about sort of, I can't remember what it is, like seven, 800 production, something like that. Not even that much, but even 700 production would give about a hundred culture in a building. And like an early game building with say 60, per, uh, 60 production would give like nine culture. This is a good way of using your buildings to boost up to the first government. And then you just get nice little culture bombs as you go through the game. You need to make sure you're building, but you know, 50 15% on buildings is going to give you more over the course of the game probably than 30% on wonders because there are more buildings and you can put them in all of your cities than there are wonders. It's just one of those things. Is it a fun ability? No. Is it useful? Yes, it's much more useful than Mediterranean's Bride. I'll be honest, like that that is a very lacking ability, bless it. That little culture will get you to governments quicker. It will help you boost through the civic tree if you're not focused on theater squares and it gives you more incentive to build wonders. It is pretty boring though. <laughs> There's nothing that's gonna blow your mind of this ability. It's just gain culture through the game. 
It helps to play wide or to have a really big capital producing wonders. Those are the tactics that really work well. Wide means you have more cities and you can use your gold to buy in the buildings or just produce them in lots of cities at the same time. This boost also works really well when your science is very far ahead and you are building things with a much bigger production cost than you have culture per turn. So if you're falling behind on civics, you can instantly get some of the earlier civics with some big buildings being put through. Towards the end of the game though, again, you're going to need a lot of buildings to get like uh, a future era civic. It's going to be way more. Like a future era civic is like 3,000 culture you need or something like that. So yeah, yeah, the, the raw culture per turn from your empire is going to be worth a lot more than this bonus gives you, but it's something. There's original Egypt, situationally good. I think Ramses is probably a little bit more reliable. I'm not going to say is too much better. I'm going to put him on generally good as opposed to situationally good because that culture can work off buildings, which is a useful thing. I think if you want to get it really, really good, the bonus would have to be bigger or maybe uh, an, an additional bonus towards wonder construction or something. I've seen a lot of modded Egypts and they could have taken ideas from any of those. But yeah, not too bad at all. Just, just a bit dull. However, everyone's new favorite Egypt, it's new Cleopatra. Ptolemaic is a, a much better version. Like already, I'll tell you now, she is better than Mediterranean's Bride. It like far better. Resources along floodplains receive one food and one culture. Own floodplains grant one appeal to adjacent tiles instead of minus one. So a few things to note. Remember our ratings. We are playing this on an average continent's map. There will not be a huge amount of floodplains. Luckily, Ptolemaic uh, Cleopatra has a pretty heavy floodplain bias. So you probably will start on one, but you might have to go searching for enough floodplain to make this ability consistently worth it. An extra food and a culture on a resource on a floodplain, hopefully you'll get at least one near your starting cities, but again, it's not a huge bonus this. This is more useful. The ability to get extra appeal. Now this stacks. If you imagine you have like two or three floodplains on a river, like along a line, that would be giving minus one to all of the tiles and they stack. So like if you had a tile that was surrounded by three floodplain tiles, it would have minus three appeal. Now it has plus three because again it stacks. That plus one appeal will stack across tiles. It means if you can get floodplains you can easily get breathtaking uh, tiles very very quickly. So by putting down sphinxes which increase appeal by two, preserves suddenly work very very well. The problem with Ptolemaic Cleopatra, the big problem is that floodplains are not that common on maps. You probably will get some, maybe you'll get two, three or even four floodplains if you're lucky, but we are doing this on an average continents map. Pretty much all of the games that I have seen this version of Cleopatra working spectacularly well on play on wetlands maps and maps where a lot of floodplain has been spawned into the game. We're talking about how good is she on a generic map? And the answer is very variable. But you don't need a huge amount. Like even if you had like one floodplain um, or like one river with like four or five tiles of floodplain, you could easily put like three or four preserves around it uh, and, and get some crazy, crazy yields. And she does help with that sort of thing. And Sphinxes means that the, the sort of preserve play is much more likely to work. There are tactics. This is finally an Egypt with a little bit of interest in how it plays. I just wish floodplains was replaced more by a river thing. I think if it was like rivers provide two appeal, maybe, or or even floodplains, uh, like that bonus, uh, resources along rivers, that would have been something that would have catapulted her up into the top tier of the game. I do think she is better. She is better than original Egypt down in situationally good. I'm going to say that she is situationally very good. If you get a spawn with a lot of floodplain, she can be very good. Otherwise, she probably drops down to more of sort of Ramsey's level. But she is definitely better than the other Egypt. So by far the, the best out of the three, like much more fun than Ramsey's. Ramsey's is probably a bit more generally good. But yeah, she can get a good spawn. And if you get two or three resources on a floodplain on your spawn, I mean, yeah, food and culture, she can spectacularly grow off. And getting those early preserves, early sphinxes, she can easily rock that early game in terms of culture, faith, and food output, but it's just so unreliable. The very definition of situational. And now we're off to Mali, another ruler of the Sahara.
Sahara. And the last one from this particular leader's pass, Sundiata Kita. This is a version of Mali that is all about great works of writing. And again, when we think about Mansa Musa and this new leader, we need to just separate out what the Mali bonuses are because they are a little bit complicated. Mali gives you the ability to get faith and food from every adjacent desert and desert hills around your city center. So settling in desert is still important if you want to get that early food and faith bonus. That faith bonus is really handy for getting a good early game uh, pantheon and if you want to go for the desert pantheon again really handy. Mines getting minus one production and four gold again the very rich mines being able to purchase commercial hub districts with uh, the district building sorry with faith and then the production penalty on buildings and units. Remember that is not a production penalty on building districts or wonders. People always forget that it's just buildings and units or um, city center projects they work fine as well. The Sugaba is one of the better districts of the game it means that you can purchase cheaper with gold and faith in that city and it's just really cheap it gives you bonuses for holy sites the faith and gold game for Mali is very very strong so what do we lose we lose the ability to get extra trade route capacities every time we hit a golden age probably over the course of the average game you may get about five trade routes from that if you're playing well so it's a decent a decent loss and international trade routes gain one gold for every flat desert tile in the origin city now what you tend to do is find a city with as much flatland desert in it as possible maybe seven or eight tiles if you're lucky and you funnel all of the trade routes from that city so you're losing a bit of gold like a, a fairly decent crack of gold you may lose like anywhere between about 50 and 100 gold per turn in the game not a negligible amount at all however it is spawn reliant you do need all that desert whereas this ability is a little bit more interesting 20 percent less gold to recruit great people that's not bad that's not bad at all and don't forget they don't have to be merchants they can be any great people including engineers and that is one of the best ways of spending your early game money there are four medieval great engineers of which two of them are wonder builders and they all cost 2000 gold each but for this Mali 1600 gold that's a 400 gold discount that's not negligible markets gain two slots for great works of writing interestingly I have actually seen that if people conquer those markets sometimes the great slots can be kept which is interesting so if you see this as a neighbor you might actually want to grab some of their cities now uh, there is a caveat to this I haven't seen that in the game myself I've just seen it on my discord and it could be a mod thing but I think that is in the game just keep an eye out for it uh, great works of writing receive four gold and two production this extra gold from your great works of writing provides you get some great works of writing don't forget you can always buy them from the ai which is a very cheap way of doing this that gold will give you enough gold to make up for the satchel merchant's ability of mansa musa i can just tell you that now the extra production means that your city with the great works of writing can then work either wonders or city projects like other great merchants or great works of writing or even scientists or engineers or whatever it might be all of these abilities as well they do not rely on any spawn of the desert yes if you you don't spawn in the desert you're going to lose a little bit of faith and food per turn from your city center but you'll still have all of these abilities whereas with Mansa Musa if you're not in the desert you don't get anything this is a very strong leader a very very strong leader you generate a lot of gold and ways to make more gold and then uses for your gold to buy great people I think this power like the, the leader power on this is is actually higher than people think it takes a little bit of time to get your head around it but there are optimizations that you can make to buy yourself a profit to buy merch chance whatever it might be even you can buy yourself a great general to go to war really early this is the definition of a snowball sieve i really like them now i have mansa musa down as situationally very good again one of those sieves that can be broken heavily if you play like a tsl map or a map with tons and tons of desert always going to be a really really good fun game i'm not taking that away however the new leader is better because you don't need the desert it's reliable you can use that gold to make more gold you can use that gold to get any great person you want this is a breakable leader this he's all the way up here he is generally excellent this is a very well synergized very powerful sieve that can get a monopoly on any type of game you want you're going science you buy all those great scientists you're going culture you buy all those writers you don't need desert and the power level
level is there. I was I was tempted to put them generally very good, but comparing to other leaders in very good compared to the leaders in excellent, no, up up there they go. Leader pass five, and we are at Byzantium again. I need to be unbiased here because Byzantium is probably one of my favourite sieves in the entire game. Basil, yeah, I'd always been a favourite of mine. The ruler born in purple, Theodora is the alternative leader. Again, we just need to separate out what the Byzantium tactic is compared to the leader tactic. Byzantium gives you the Hippodrome, which is the cheaper entertainment complex that provides all of the amenities and it provides to you a free heavy cavalry unit when you build it and when you put a building in it. They are so cheap, they give you three amenities rather than one. So with an arena, you get two, three units and five amenities in a city. Huge. That is such a happiness bonus. It's why Byzantium is so strong. You don't, however, have the Tagma unit. This is a knight replacement and it is specifically for Basel. So these are going to be spawning you knight and war chariots and cuirassars instead of tagma. They're still three, they're still powerful, but they're not quite as powerful. Dromen are a unique classical quadrarine replacement with two range and ten extra combat strength against units. These are so powerful! People sleep on how good these are. Oh, Byzantium isn't a naval sieve. Oh, Dromans aren't worth it. No, if you don't think Dromans are worth it, if you're going to make any argument to say that Dromans aren't worth it, respectfully, go and play Byzantium again and use them and you will see how powerful they are. They are so, so powerful. Because what you're doing is you're killing units with them. They just swoop along the coast, get a couple of little snipe kills, and then Byzantium's taxis will come into play. Byzantium's religion is spread to nearby cities when defeating an enemy unit. It's a religious burst. You get Crusade on your religion. Crusade is not a religious tenant that is taken often by the AI at all. It is very reliable. It means you can, con you can convert and Crusade without actually ever having to actually embark onto the land of the AI. It's amazing. You get a three great profit point from cities with a holy site district, so they're worth two instead of one. Very handy. And on top of that, you still have the three combat strength uh, and religious strength for every holy city, including your own, converted to your religion. That means on a standard map, I think you can get up to plus 15, because I think it lets you have five religions. I think on a small map, it's four religions, so you're up to plus 12. Huge combat bonus. You don't, however, have the ability for heavy and light cavalry units to do full damage against cities following your religion. That is a shame, because Tagma rushes against walls are incredibly powerful as Basil. Basil is a full-out domination powerhouse. You get the hang of Basil, unbeatable. So Theodora doesn't have a heavy cavalry unit that's unique, and she doesn't have the ability for her cavalry to break down walls. What does she have? Holy sites provide culture equal to their adjacency bonus. Farms can provide a faith adjacency to hippodromes and holy sites. This is a standard adjacency. It doesn't explicitly say that, but it is standard. So if you have a holy site with nothing around it but plain fields and you put six farms around it, that will be a plus six holy site. So it'll give you six faith and six culture because all of your faith adjacency is up there. This is an incredible ability. All of your holy sites at the very minimum should have either plus five or plus six adjacency. It is so easy to do because all you're looking for is mountains, natural wonders, and farms. Find some flat land, stick the holy site down onto it, get a couple of builders, and whoop round it. If you get work ethic, your holy sites then give you faith, culture, and production. There's a great scientist that means you can be getting science as well from adjacency from one holy site. You don't even need work ethic. The Theodora actually works really well with warrior monks. She works well with Feed the World. She works well with uh, Jesuit education. You need to pick up a religion to get taxes to work, but this extra adjacency and then the culture you get from it is huge. Right from the outset, if you build that first holy site and you're getting five or six culture per turn, you are catapulting towards that first government and your first civics. Getting 100 culture per turn by turn 100 has never been easier. Every single one of your cities will, by the time you get the card that gives you double holy site adjacency, you'll be easily getting 10 or 12 culture per turn per city just from the holy side. It is my belief belief that Theodora is not as strong as Basil, um, but that's because Basil is overpowered. Basil is broken, but like just ridiculous. Theodora is still incredibly strong and a match for pretty much anyone else in the game. More importantly, a lot of fun as well. I, I, I love Byzantium, I really do. Although she's not as strong as Basil, she has to go for generally excellent. Up there with the very best sieves in the game. And now we're off to Germany to find a hundred, no fifty, no, no one one swan in, given to you by the Swan King Ludwig. 
one of the most fun civs in the game. Ludwig adds so much to Germany, really does pin Germany together a little bit better. Because Frederick, yes, having an additional military policy slot is really powerful. Like, people go, oh, seven combat strength on attacking city-states. Oh, it's not very good. I know it's not very good. The military policy slot is the bit that people forget about. Having any extra policy slot in any government is so good. It makes classical republic really useful right at the beginning of the game because you can still produce units while getting all of the other cards. Ludwig doesn't have that. He has the ability to get two culture for every adjacent district to a wonder, even if not finished. What you do is you play very weirdly, you unlock every wonder you can, and you slap every wonder in the game onto the map, and they will be giving you culture per turn. You also can turn culture adjacency into tourism after you get castles. It's a really good source of tourism. Now, one of the things I need to caveat with Ludwig is when Ludwig first came out, there was this whole thing that Ludwig was so broken that you'd be able to get culture victories in less than turn 100. I'm telling you now, this tourism you get from castles, it will not get you a victory. It's not as much as you think it is. It really, really isn't. All of the culture victories I've seen with Ludwig really early are still relying on all of the other things that you can do with any leader. Reliquaries, heroes and legends, secret societies, all of this sort of stuff. This particular burst of tourism isn't that big. However, it is very helpful. It adds to tourism you already have and this culture can be plonked down really really early into the game and you can get easily like 50 to 100 culture per turn in the game by turn 100 just from this ability if you plonk down those wonders. Combine it with an extra district in every city, one of the most powerful abilities in the entire game, and the Hansa, arguably the best district in the game because it's so cheap to build, and the production you can get by whacking commercial hubs and other green districts around it. Ludwig is a powerhouse. Germany was already a powerhouse. Uh, arguably, Frederick didn't add much to Germany's ability. Germany's ability was what held up the entire civilization. Ludwig does add something. A huge amount of early game culture, and is a lot of fun to play. Whether or not Ludwig is better than Frederick is debatable because I do think people don't appreciate just how good a three military policy slot is. Certainly more fun though. I really like Ludwig. Lu I prefer Ludwig and, and uh, is as powerful at the very minimum. I would argue probably a little more powerful. But in the same breath, so another really, really easy one to rate. You can see Germany and Frederick is already in generally excellent. Ludwig is up there as well. Germany has always been a very strong sieve and nothing changes there. The last leader of the fifth iteration of the leader's past takes us to Korea and Sejong. Back from Civilization 5, just like Theodora, the ability is a little bit different to the original version of Korea. Korea itself has a very strong ability. The Huacha is a very satisfyingly strong unit. It comes in way cheaper than the field cannon and can decimate enemy armies. The Siawon is a campus that always has plus four science and it's really cheap to build. Pe it, it's so powerful. People say, oh, I think that the Mayans and the observatory is better than Korea. Respectfully, no. The Sail One is so strong. Reliable plus four science means that once you get the adjacency card, every city has a plus eight campus. And when rationalism comes in, they always have 50% extra science in all buildings in that district. So strong. Plus, because it doesn't want to be put next to any other district, you get the whole science for every mine around the Sail One and farm for every uh, food for every farm around it. And that's tax as well. So if you have sort of tessellating sale ones, you can get double bonuses. It's really cool. So how is Sejong different? Um, instead of getting 3% culture and science for every promotion on a governor in the city, so that if you had a fully promoted governor in a city would be giving 18% extra culture and science in that city. Very, very powerful with Pingala, for instance, but very limited to only a few cities. You've only got so many governor promotions, so you've got to make sure that you pop them into your cities with lots and lots of production, or, or population I guess. Sejong instead gives you a burst of culture equal to double your science per turn every time you discover the first technology from a new era. Now there's a little bit of micromanagement to do. You need to make sure that you're working science projects, you need to be working uh, science specialists, you need to make sure you have all the cards in, so you know you, you end up doing this sort of weird thing where you start edging technology, and then once you get the technology you get the culture which you've optimized. It kind of from practice means that you effectively get one three civic every time you go to a new era, which 
kind of works out because there's about 9 to 10 civics per era. It's about 10% extra culture. So it doesn't feel very good, but it is actually pretty good. And you just get it. Ugh, who is better out of the two of them? I think there's a certain argument to making sure that your Pingala city, which already had 15% extra culture and science, now has another 18%, so is on 33% culture and science, and then you put happiness into it and all these sort of things. Like, the absolute science production that you can make on original Korea is impressive. Sejong doesn't quite have that, but that you don't need it because the Seowon is so powerful anyway. Having a little bit of extra culture in burst is just a different way of getting to a very, very similar outcome. It's a matter of personal preference, really. Do you want to play with governors or do you want to play with your science and where your techs go? Y you can pick either way. For me, Korea is still reliable. They're generally excellent. They're top tier. I already had a career up in generally excellent. I don't think this career is any different. Kind of fundamentally very, very similar. Finally, we have the last version of the leader pass. Pass number six, the rulers of England pass and new Varangian Harold. One that has certainly stirred quite a bit of debate in the community because a lot of what made Norway good turns out is on the leader of Thunderbolt of the North Herald. Let's talk about what we lose to start with. We lose the ability to coastal raid with any naval melee unit. So the Viking longship is a naval melee unit. We can no longer raid. We lose 50% production towards those boats. We lose the fact that we can pillage science from mines and culture from quarries, pastures, plantations, and camps. We even lose the Viking longship itself. There is a huge amount that is lost because Norway really worked off spamming those units out and pillage, 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 pillage. Even if someone isn't on the sea and you can't use the Viking longships, you can still get science and culture from all of your regular pillaging from your berserkers, from your cavalry, whenever you go to regular continental landlocked war. It's a big loss. No, I, I can't believe they got rid of the Viking longship. But what do we get instead? We keep the ability to enter ocean tiles after researching ship, uh, shipbuilding. It is useful. You can investigate the map quite early compared to what you would normally do. We can still heal naval melee units in neutral territory. You may not be using as much, but it's there. And you can still embark and disembark units at no additional cost. Quite handy. This ability doesn't sound like it works well with New Harold, but it does and I'll explain why in a second. Berserkers are stronger than regular mana arms and they get plus 10 combat strength when attacking. They attack with the strength of muskets. They are actually stronger than muskets. They're really powerful. They're almost line inventory. And when you're attacking with them in enemy territory, they have four movement, which means they can pillage and then attack. Very handy. Stand on a farm, pillage, heal yourself, attack a city. Unkillable in that regard. They do have minus five strength when defending. So that's a 15 combat strength swing. So you may have to find yourself building quite a few of them, but it's all about speed. Just attack, 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 you'll probably be fine. Stave churches as well. One of these buildings that doesn't sound very good on paper, but is amazing. If you build a stave church, a holy site gets an additional standard adjacency from woods. So once you get conservation and you have a holy site with six woods around it, that will have nine adjacency. It's big. With work ethic, that's an 18 production holy site. It makes a big difference. Remember we spoke about Theodora in Byzantium earlier? This is the sort of mentality you have to get into. Just find a holy site, plonk woods around it, or find some woods around it, and you can get really big adjacency, because this standard adjacency stacks on top of the minor adjacency that woods normally gives. So two woods is now worth three rather than one. Plus one production to all coastal resource tiles in the city. It's basically like a free work, uh, what was it, the god of the sea pantheon? Hey, it's like having a free Auckland ability. It's fine, a little bit of extra production. Don't say no. And then we have the meat of Harold's new ability. 75% discount on levying units and levied units receive culture, faith and science from kills equal to 50% of the opponent's combat strength. Don't get me wrong, culture, faith and science from city, state, levied troops is really nice. It's really, really nice. Early game, that can give you boosts that gives you entire civics and techs. Late game, it's not going to give you a lot. It also means you can get a pantheon really quickly rather than having to rely on god king. That in itself is quite handy. It's tough to employ. 
The ability really centers around the 75% discount. This is a huge, huge deal. At the beginning of the game, a city-state on deity will have five warriors. That can be levied for 200 gold. Uh, Varangia and Harold can levy it for 50 gold. So for 50 gold, which is way less than the cost of buying a warrior yourself, you can borrow five from a city-state. A lot of people, including myself, struggled with Harold, uh, Varangia and Harold originally because you try and compare it to Hungary, the city-state master. Hungary and Raven King means that your levied units have extra movement, extra combat strength, you can upgrade them cheaply, and you gain envoys with the city-state when you levy from it. This Norway does none of that stuff. They are not stronger, they are not faster, you cannot upgrade them, and you don't get envoys. However, you, what you're doing is you're not controlling all of the city-states, you are being opportunistic. Taking Armani, who will give you two envoys out of city-state, you you investigate around the world using your ability, you find city-states that are around enemies, you levy them for almost no gold, and then you declare war on them. And it works even better when you are ages and ages away from the AI. You throw the units in, you pillage as much as you can, you kill all of the enemy army, you don't bother taking cities, just go for skirmishes, killing all of the units, get as much boost as you can. If your city-state units die, doesn't matter, let the city-state go. Make peace after 10 turns and just enjoy the fruits of your labor. What you're doing is you basically use these amounts to save yourself gold, to get lots of culture, faith, and science, a ton of gold from pillaging, use your berserkers to help with that attack, and basically just use your stave churches at home to make entirely productive cities that you can just be kind of producing out of the way. Your cities don't have to be anywhere near the people you're attacking, because once you've found a city-state, it could be on the other side of the world. You attack, you generate barely any grievances, you make make peace, they forget about it, all is well. The other little secret thing to remember is when it says that units gain the ability to enter ocean tiles after researching shipbuilding, remember, it's just it's not just your shipbuilding. Now, what you can do is never unlock shipbuilding yourself. It means that your units can't go out to sea. However, city-states have their own tech. City-states will beeline shipbuilding as soon as they can if they are anywhere near the sea. And actually, they normally get it pretty quickly anyway. Once you levy the units, the city-state will have unlocked shipbuilding for you, the city-state units can actually go to sea, and they will immediately be able to go to ocean because then your ability applies. So what you do is you levy city-states that are in the middle of nowhere, and you send all of their units across the sea to attack someone ages away from you, and then it doesn't matter if those units never come back. It's actually weirdly useful. I've played a few games with this where I actually didn't unlock it myself. At, at no point could my units go onto the sea, but the city-states could, so it was fine. It's a very very, very fun version of Harold. It is a crying shame that all of the abilities from Thunderbolt of the North weren't already on Norway. However, it is still a lot of fun. Is it as strong as original Harold? Well, I had him down as situationally excellent. Yes, you need a little bit of a naval thing. You need the AI to put improvements down. I think this new version of Norway is still situational. You need good proximity to city-states. You need good understrength AI that do have units. You need to be able to attack one city-state into another. There's a lot that, you know, needs to happen for you, but they can work quite well. I don't think they're as strong though. So I'm popping them instead of situationally excellent, I'm going to put them as situationally very good. Not as strong as original Norway, but still a lot of fun. And now we shoot off to England, where Victoria has gone from Empire to Steam and is looking rather dapper. Now, England I really like, and I know a lot of people don't value England as very good. I always thought Workshop of the World and Royal Navy Dockyards and Sea Dogs and all this sort of thing, industry, gold, Production of military units it is all fantastic. A hugely versatile sieve, uh, one I really enjoy playing, and Victoria Age of Steam makes it even better. 10% production in cities for every industrial zone building that is in the city. So just to reconfirm, that is the workshop, the factory, and then a power plant. So three buildings in an industrial zone city, a total of a maximum of 30% production. On top of that, two production to all strategic resources, everything from horse and iron all the way through to aluminium, oil, and uranium. Oh boy, this is a fun leader. So as opposed to the other version of Victoria, there's none of this 
getting extra trade routes on different continents and giving yourself three boats every time you build Royal Navy dockyards. And again, you lose the red coat. I like red coats. Red coats are very, very powerful. When they're on another continent, they can attack with the power of mechanized infantry. They are so strong, it is ridiculous. You don't get any of that. What you do, however, have is once you hit industrialization and you get factories and coal power plants, you start getting 30% production in all cities. Oh my lord, is that strong? Because you can also build your industrial zone buildings 20% quicker anyway, because you've got Workshop of the World and you're getting extra coal in order to power other buildings in the first place. And on top of that, you're being forced to build more Royal Navy dockyards, which in turn give you more production than commercial hubs do. Victoria Age of Steam is just crazy production. You've seen my recent games. I think I managed to get a city almost to 2000 production per turn. This makes England naturally incredibly synergized. And more importantly, it is more reliable than the other version of Victoria. The only unreliable bit is whether or not you get production from strategic resources. Sometimes, even if you have it unbalanced, you don't get any. It's just, it's just Civ 6. It's what happens. All you need to do is hold on, get yourself a couple of Royal Navy dockyards, get yourself a couple of little benefits with Workshop of the World, and wait until you get industrial zones and you will have 30% bonus production in every city. It's very strong. I'm beginning to sound like a bit broken record because everything is just going into generally excellent at the moment, but where you consider we had original Vicky and then Eleanor of Aquitaine, I, I rate England highly. Uh, I had uh, Vicky down as situationally excellent and I had Eleanor of Aquitaine England down as generally excellent. I think Vicky is up there, uh, Steam Vicky is uh, generally excellent. I, I just, yeah, she's just too consistently powerful. There is none of the situationalness with the original Vicky. It's slightly different, but that production will get you very far in the game. And then you have Elizabeth I, again, back from Civ 5. Would you be interested? Hang on, no, let me just do the, the I've got to do it properly. Dear viewer, would you be interested in a trade agreement with England? It's a very fun ability. You get two extra trade route capacity after acquiring your first Great Admiral, as long as they're Renaissance era or before. That gives you the total of about nine to 10 Admirals to get. So when you're getting two Admiral points per turn from each Royal Navy Dockyard, you should be getting one of these. I like you like you have to it, it's impossible not to then trade routes to any city state provide three gold for every specialty district in the origin city and you get more plundering from trade routes with naval units now that plundering with trade routes it will give you some benefit every now and then the trade route capacity extra by two it, it's useful it's not game breaking these are not the bits you should be concerned about three gold on a trade route to a city state it means a number of things firstly your capital should be population 10 that means it's got four districts on it which means production or well, gold from your trade routes to city states should be at 12 gold per turn quite quickly she can make mansa musa blush with the amount of raw gold from trade routes her trade routes for city states can rival even portugal's it also is any city with specialty districts so say you're on a map with only like seven or eight tradable city states sometimes it happens on smaller maps they can just be out the way or you won't find them make two or three different trading cities and then even better, focus on uh, friending a few of them, use Vessel Bank and use democracy. Those trade routes to city states will give you food and production. Elizabeth definitely needs to play uh, monarchy in order to get the extra envoys and in order to get the uh, diplomatic quarter down as quickly as you can to get all the extra envoy points. But she is the gold capacitor of all of the other. Like, like you've got different versions, right? You've got Age of Steam, which is production England. You've got Age of Empire, which is military England. You've got Court of Love, which is just hilarious I'll grab your cities England and now you have Drake's legacy which is gold England combined with the Royal Navy Dockyard and the sheer amount of gold that harbors give you generally because not only do you get harbor gold from the actual build, uh, district itself and the adjacency but all of the buildings improve the gold of the actual tiles around your city the buildings themselves will give you gold once you start putting envoys into mercantile city-states and of course you have the trade routes on top of it you will be so rich playing Elizabeth the first so rich rich and gold leads to a very versatile game. Personally, I believe her benefit is reliable enough to make her generally excellent rather than situationally excellent. She probably straddles the line a little bit closer, but when you compare like, is she better than Age of Empire Vicky or is she better than uh, Production Vicky? I think she's more up here. So I'm gonna put her in generally excellent. She's probably not quite as good, but still as a leader, oh boy, is she a lot of fun and oh boy, is she powerful. So there we have it. This is 
is my tier list, going from generally excellent all the way down to situationally good. Let me know in the comments how what you think of my tier list, what, what you would say, any changes you would make. I'm always interested to hear your opinions. However, before we finish, there is one observation I must make. Generally excellent is now a lot more full. There were 19 leaders in the new leaders pass and I have put eight of them into generally excellent. It is a lot of new leaders. We now have a grand total of 25 leaders in generally excellent. And I do believe that I would agree that any of these games, if you, if you rolled a random game and I was given any of these leaders, my heart would immediately flutter with joy and go, yes, now we're onto something. But 25 people is too much to have into one bracket. I am finally going to put my neck on the line and I'm going to make my top five serves. I've done it. I'm going to do it. Using all of my rules before, using all of my explanations and incorporating in what I think is a balanced style of play, I believe these are the five strongest leaders in the game. Oh man, committing myself to this list is really tough. It's really tough. They're all going to come from a generally excellent and all of these sieves, you could make an argument to be in the top five. Like, it's close. Again, in the comments, let me know, what are your top five? At number five, number five is... Matthias and Hungary. I still believe that Hungary's ability to city-state levy, secure the city-state with more envoys, to move the troops, to upgrade them to whatever is your highest strength unit for like really cheap, and to then slam them into enemy units. Combine that with the fact that you're building districts and building super quick across rivers, and that Hungary has some of the best unique units in the game with just an almighty huzzah! I mean, that thing can be as powerful as modern armor if you train it up right. Hungary's potential to catapult into a snowball domination victory sub 100 turns just makes him one of the most powerful units. Even late game, borrow a city state, levy the units, convert them all into mechanized inventory. Y you can have so much fun with Hungary. Like, so powerful. I will forever be grateful to the video I put onto Potato McWhiskey's channel when he let me put a video up when he was on holiday. I showed off Matthias's abilities there and yeah so just i forever will be in my top set of leaders i i yeah i i i stand by that one number four and a very close number four to matthias of hungary it is and i know this one will be a little bit more controversial english eleanor of aquitaine now i've heard it all before eleanor of aquitaine you really overvalue how good court of love is why play england france is way more synergized no no no, 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 no. There's some things you need to remember. First of all, in Civ, England is better than France. I'm sorry, it just is. You get gold production, you get trade routes, you have additional strategic resource capacity, and you have the ability to put industry down in your sieves. If you're worried about producing culture as Eleanor of Aquitaine, you're not playing her right. She is not a culture sieve. She is a science and domination sieve. Through and through, French Eleanor of Aquitaine isn't even a culture victor. Like, that is not how you play Eleanor of Aquitaine. Play England, get trade routes, get gold, buy your great works of writing and your great works of other artwork from the AI. You don't even need to make them yourself. And then you steal cities with the Court of Love, with no diplomatic pressure, with no population loss. You can just devour and you can do it to your allies as well. If you don't think Court of Love is that powerful, you're not playing it right. It is, to this day, one of the most broken abilities in Civ. The only reason she's not number one is the fact that on continents maps sometimes you don't have enough neighbors to really take over too much of the map but you can guarantee you will have the entirety of your continent by the end of the game so so powerful i will forever be in the court of love camp eleanor will forever be my queen there you go i've said it now we're into the top three and in third place for me out of all of the generally excellent sieves it's yong lei of china china was always really good fun the extra 10 percent science on your and the extra 10% on inspirations on uh, civics was always really good. Great Wall, Crouching Tigers, all very consistently good things. But the ability to get that much science and culture and gold from just cities existing and having population 
Combine that with a project that means that you can grow your cities manually to population 10. And then, once it gets to population 10 and it's making all the science and culture and gold, you can put four districts down. So you can have a campus and a commercial hub and a theatre square. Y your empire will be generating yields that are so far ahead of the AI, it's ridiculous. And, more importantly, you can play tall with him. And wide. But tall works with Yonglei. The strats. The strats with this leader are so snowbally and so broken. Yeah, I, what a wonderful leader. Really, really good fun. And actually the first of the new leaders that makes it to my top five. Yeah, I feel very confident about that. Which brings us to second place. In second, my second best leader in the game is Mongolia's Genghis Khan. Genghis doesn't even bring a huge amount to it. I mean, it, it's it's that close between actually having Kublai instead of Genghis. Genghis lets you produce slightly more powerful cavalry that can take over other cavalry. So from a domination point of view, it's fun. But that's not why we're here. We're here because Mongolia is one of the strongest abilities in the game. That extra combat strength from diplomatic visibility, you get twice as much. The fact that you get diplomatic visibility from using trade routes, and the fact that with a spy and a couple of great merchants, you can reliably have anywhere from plus 12 to plus 24 combat strength over the AI. Combine that with an extra movement speed on horses and the fact that you probably have great generals making them too faster with your with your Ordu um, unique uh, stables. Genghis can strike hard, fast, pillage the absolute hell out of an enemy. Like, that's what you do with the cavalry. You make horsemen, you make courses cavalry, helicopters, all with depredation, you pillage every tile in an enemy and you can do it so quickly and your troops are so strong because that diplomatic visibility applies even defensively. So city attacks, ranged attacks, they will barely scratch your units. This is still the best pillaging sieve and actually the second best domination sieve in the game. Yes, you have to go aggressive to make Genghis work, but if you do, victories are unavoidable. You, the aim I cannot beat Genghis Khan. And you know who my number one is because you know how much I love them. It's Basil. There's no, there's no, we're not even like arguing about it. Step one, get crusade. Step two, attack. Step three, win. If your AI neighbor is stupid enough to make its own religion, within a couple of turns of invading them with dromans and tagmas and even heavy chariots, and don't forget, you can even attack a city-state to start with to get the ball rolling. But that Crusade and Taxis will begin your fighting with plus 13 combat strength. It goes to plus 16 as soon as you take your first religion. Add in plus 5 for great generals. Add in the fact that you will always be happy with your Hippodromes. You can generate three units that can then take out walls. There is a reason I have won a 50-player game within 150 turns with Basel. He is unbeatable. This is how powerful I would put Basel on a level even above all of these other ones. I believe if I was playing anybody, anybody watching this video in multiplayer and you let me play Basel, I would win. I, I don't even think there is anything you could do to stop me. That is how powerful Basel is. Do you remember I said that like 90 to 95% of all of his abilities was player skill and not leader skill? This is the exception that breaks and proves the rule. So there you have it. That is my top five. There is my tier list. I really, really, really hope you enjoyed it. I spent a lot of time thinking about this and coming up with all my reasoning. Remember, if you want to ask me anything and you don't want to leave a comment on this video, pop along to Discord because these sort of chats happen all the time. I'm more than willing to have a little bit of a chat to explain my reasoning. More importantly, I'd love to see your tier list. Come along and, you know, let me see what you've got. I always like to see the reasoning. I always like to know where I may have missed a strat. But looking at this list, I'm pretty happy. I'm pretty happy with where things fall right now. If you wouldn't mind leaving it a comment, leaving it a like, subscribing to the channel, all that glorious stuff, I'd be eternally grateful. But until next video, I will see you all next time. Goodbye! And finally, a very special shout out goes to Glorious Petra, Matthew Wilkinson, Paul Coffey, Doughboy91, Sean Gratis, Portland, Scott Stratton, Major King Kong, Devil X, Skeptical Bear, Kroger Brand Trail Mix, Alex Noob, Cinnamon Beard, Petra Ryan, Matthew Hatch, Amir EC, Rom88, Radio Torre, Private Selection, Genoa Salami, Boy Zorro, Callum Billy, Garrett Gowan, Polar Bear Ray, El Truand, Creston, RB Hedge, Mushkin Mandeltort, Ezri Dax, Debel Time, Shoelace, Burial, I'm Daft, Guberman, Clint Hennes, Thank you all for your support, it's amazing, see you all next time, goodbye!